This podcast is brought to you by KimPower, the reliable, quick, and scalable EV charging solutions for everyone and everywhere. And StarCharge, the largest EV charging manufacturer in the world and is also a provider of residential and commercial battery storage. This episode is also made possible by the support we get from Fort Collins Kia. If you are in the market for any electric Kia, not only do they never add market adjustments, they will deliver your car to you anywhere in the 48 contiguous states for out-of-spec viewers. More information in the link in the show notes. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Out of Spec Podcast. I am Francie. If you don't know me or the podcast, welcome. And welcome back to everyone else. Here we talk about all things electric. Of course, with a huge focus on electric vehicles and also everything that relates to it. And there's so much to talk about. And today, you, I hope I caught you at a great time because you're coming along with me on a bit of a storytelling podcast because this last week, this past week and weekend, I went on a, on a long road trip. I went down through Alabama, down to the Forgotten Coast in Florida, and then up to Savannah, Georgia, because I was invited to attend Electrification 2024 and that event put on by EPRI, who we have featured members of that organization and their research before, specifically an episode about if the utility grid is ready for the electrification that is incoming with their, with Dan Bowermaster from EPRI. And I will link that in the show notes. I got to see Dan at the event, which was great. So yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, what I saw and learned at this event and the interesting topics, as well as some fun anecdotes along the way. So let's dive in. I started the road trip, like I said, and you might be wondering if you've been following along, you know that I have a company car, a company three-year lease with the VinFast VF8 Eco. I have other podcasts about that, of course, and how that has been over a month now, over a thousand miles. And I did not take this EV on this road trip. I was going to be in very rural places where charging, you know, I didn't really even want to think about it, but also uh, there were just some other reasons. So I took my Subaru Outback on this road trip, which was really great. <laughs> you don't have to stop for charging. It is it is pretty nice. Of course, there are benefits to pulling over and spending some time outside of your car. And, you know, I split up the road trip, so I wasn't rushing, but there's something nice about driving for however long you want on one tank of gas. But going electric is awesome too. Can't wait for better infrastructure. Okay, so after my trip down to Florida, I went up to Savannah, Georgia. I'd never been to Savannah, Georgia before, and it I'm so glad I got to go. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this event, Electrification 2024. So EPRI hosted the Electrification 2024 International Conference and Exposition that featured immersive pre-conference workshops, compelling agenda sessions, and a collaborative exposition hall, and multiple networking functions. So I only showed up to the last day of the event because that's the only day that I could make it. So unfortunately, I didn't get to go to many networking events except for the last one. And I got to see, you know, the last day of the panels and sessions. And I wish I could have seen more, but it was really cool to be there at all. For a sustainable enterprise to work, it has to consider the three Ps, people, planet, and profit. That is how you can really make an impact. You got to meet all of those. And that's not easy. So I do appreciate events like this that help collaboration between entities happen and help get new ideas out there, new products, and uh, saw some fun things while I was there. It was at the Savannah, Georgia Convention Center, which is right on the Savannah River. Very beautiful. And I was standing outside getting some sunshine when, you know, after walking around the event and I was standing next to the water, but looking at my phone. (laughs) And then I hear next to me, And then I look down and there are two dolphins that are coming up for air right next to me in the river. So I stood there on the edge and watched them crest a few more times and watched them swim up river, actually, up the Savannah River. And I looked towards 
that's where you could see the shipyard that I will talk about in a little bit that has had some electrification efforts as well. So that was really cool. I saw dolphins in the river and then I walked over to give me a chance to walk up to some other people at the event that were uh, along the water and, you know, say, Hey, did you see those dolphins? But I was kind of surprised to see them. If you know about dolphins and why they would be up river at such a busy part of the river, I would love to hear your comments, read your comments below. Okay. So when I walked in, of course, I saw Kim Power right there. And as you probably know, we have a partnership with Kim Power. They are one of our sponsors. They have been and they are right now. And we are a pretty big fan of their work. They have a very great footprint over in Europe and they're a Finnish company. So they have chargers in the cold. They have chargers in every environment and they have deployed chargers. And now they're coming to North America. So there's Kim Power you know, US and Canada. And we have a series of podcasts that is coming out every Wednesday for a bit of the foreseeable future, highlighting what Kim Power is doing. So I got to go to the booth and talk to the people there and also interact with the hardware. Of course, it's dummy hardware on the on the scene. And I can't wait to go and interact with these in person somewhere, maybe in over on the East Coast. That would be great at their headquarters. But I did get to pick up the cable, which is and use the cable management system. And it was pretty great. I've lifted a lot of heavy cables with and without cable management. Of course, Tesla is just a really simple light cable, but uh, typical CCS cables are pretty, pretty hefty. So I really like their cable management system. Their dispensers are very small, so the very small footprint. And they, of course, have modular designs in the cabinets and are really able to scale up or, or yeah, scale, scale their their sites very well so that you can adapt to the growing EVs on the market, like their design in general. We'll cover that. And it was great to see the Kim Power people. I went up to the It's Electric, had a small little station, and I had an interview with Nathan King, one of the founders of It's Electric that does curbside charging, where you have your own detachable cable that when you become like an It's Electric m member, and then they send that to you, you can keep that in your car. You park next to this curbside pillar that is a level two charger that uses the energy from a local nearby building and you plug in your car. So I got to hold one of those cables and took a little dorky photo. I had Dante, who was there, take a photo of me. But that was great to see that in person. I think it's a really cool idea. They have their first site and they're in Brooklyn and in New York. And they have their first site live in Detroit with more coming. They are UL certified. Great to see it and uh, lo lovely to see a member of their team. I also was approached by a company called DG Matrix, and there were a lot of claims that they made that I would love to see how those progress and see them in person. But basically that their DC fast chargers are extremely small, have extremely small hardware components, but are capable of 200, 400 kilowatt charging. And I would be interested to see um, how they go about. They say that they're launching their pilot in a couple weeks, a few weeks. There were also like, uh, there's a big uh, trash truck, garbage truck that was electric Mac EV trucks. I would love to see more fleet electrification. There wasn't anyone there for me to speak to, but I think that these big heavy duty trucks that sit a lot and also drive a lot and have consistent routes are really great opportunities for electrification. There were panels, of course, that I attended, and they a lot of them happened at the same time, so you had to pick which one you wanted to go to most. So the one that I went to, the first one, was electrifying non-road transportation vehicles and that industry. So non-road transportation vehicles. These are vehicles on shipyards, at ports, uh, mining, um, in, in uh, distribution centers and warehouses. So they're not out for the public roads, but they are making things happen behind the scenes. The first speaker was Robert Bond, and he was from Tri Lift Industries, Inc., and he spoke about forklifts, lift trucks. He called it the biggest little industry. I'm reading from my notebook here if you're tuning in on YouTube, which please do, and subscribe and like if you enjoy what we're doing. And he described how forklifts and lift trucks touch everything. Everything in our lives has probably interacted with a forklift or a lift truck somewhere along the way, which was interesting, very behind the scenes. He noted that they are now experiencing what economics economists call a bull economy. Post-COVID, there is a backlog that was caused by you know, the repercussions of a global epidemic. And 
there's a backlog that can consider electric units over internal combustion unit uh, engines, engine units as their primary forklift and lift truck solutions. So he noted the cost drivers, of course, are fuel, propane, and diesel, maintenance, and safety. And one thing I'd like to note is that I have seen forklifts that use hydrogen, that are hydrogen-powered electric forklifts. And um, this is pretty interesting. BMW has them on their, on their centers in Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina, which we went there for the BMW Test Fest, Kyle and I, and saw that firsthand. They are definitely experimenting with hydrogen and their vehicles. He noted that the pros of forklifts are that they're quieter. You know how loud a warehouse is, lower vibrations, and they are more efficient. And there are major battery considerations, of course. And if you were going to buy them, he kind of noted some things that you would you would want to consider of course, amongst the fact that it's a lower overall ownership cost, but the type of battery, lead acid, drop-in lithium, and integrated lithium, I think he really kind of leaned towards the integrated lithium batteries and that if, you, if you're going to buy one, to make sure that you buy a product where the manufacturer manufactures the EV battery as well so that you can take best advantage of the full value chain of the product, as he said, the, the BMS, the charger integration, warranty support, all of that be able to troubleshoot directly with the manufacturer of not only the machine, but the creator of the battery. And I thought that was a good point. He said that you can look at the MSDSU, the battery manufacturing information of a product to make sure that they, whoever they is, the entity from which you're buying this product, actually manufactured the battery. I thought that was a good idea, especially if you're trying to outfit your forklift fleet. And the planning, training, culture shift, and savings are his main takeaways. That, of course, you have to plan for a kind of transition, train people on this new kind of equipment. There's a culture shift around this, of course. You can imagine going from diesel to electric. That is no surprise. And change in work culture as well. And the savings. There's a price, and that is distinct from the cost. Then... Paul Harkness went on from the Port of Savannah Garden City Terminal to speak about something that I found really, really interesting, actually. So the electrification of port container handling equipment. This is a diesel-driven industry for sure. What they're called is ship-to-shore cranes that take cargo from ships and put it on the shore. And Garden City Terminal at the Port of Savannah is the largest of its kind in North and South America, 1,503 acres. It's a 34 ship to shore, or there are 34 ship to shore cranes, 34 cranes on this site. They, he said that they get 22 vessel calls per week, 3 million containers moved a year, over 100,000 hours of crane usage a year, and over 800,000 of hours of RTG usage a year. So he was saying, why would, you know, why would you electrify a port? Environmental, of course, environmental concerns, cost, and reliability, he said. There's a huge cost of fuel. There's This can also considers labor. There are people whose job it is to fuel things, uh, to supply, of course, the fuel, store it, and maintain that whole system. So also there's the question of why not electrify. So there might be operational constraints, cost, and technical feasibility obstacles. So you have to be flexible need to have some of the same footprint, basically, that the EV can do with the ICE can. And fixed infrastructure is a hindrance, as he was saying. If you're running on fuel, you can move around wherever. If you're running on electricity, you're likely plugged in somewhere. These aren't using batteries. So that is a bit of a hindrance. And I had a question that I didn't get to ask, but like, how much did this transition cost them? Because they did do a pretty big transition. They upgraded two electric cranes as proof of concept. The pros that they found were that it was very reliable, maintenance was low, that the cons were it can only go so far, like we said, it can only reach so far. It's also good for 25 to 30 years, and it does not often lose power. And there is a significant reduction in noise, and all the opposites can be said for diesel, according to this 
man from the port. So he also spoke about decision drivers. Why would they decide to do this? Diesel power plants, uh, those have a shorter lifespan. There is a lot of maintenance and replacement costs. It is five to seven times higher costs to run diesel internal combustion engine systems than electric cranes. And they paid 50% more for energy for the diesel compared to electric when they made the transition, which is pretty crazy. And again, he noted reliability. Reliability is higher, higher with the electric options. So they basically were able to electrify different parts of their shipyard. And something that he noted that was important was supercapacitors, where once a crane goes up and that crane comes back down, the energy that is released when it you know just falls with gravity is recaptured, this potential energy. So that was really cool. They talked about having cranes that they needed to go two miles and they can't go that far, right? But they said that they did manage to make it go 2,300 feet. They partnered with a cable provider to be able to extend that, which is pretty, I mean, this is a lot of work that they're putting into this. And they also, you know, their dock design and the structures there were not designed to have cables running through them and be electrified and to plug in a crane. You know, you have to think, okay, now where do we plug in the crane? Are there cables underneath the dock? There's no platforms under there. There's no conduit. So they basically had to run cables with no conduit under the docks and no platforms. And they used cables designed for mines, but they wouldn't repeat that, but they did make it work. This is definitely a case study. I do love case studies in these electrification, probably because of you know what I studied. It's all case studies, but this is really interesting and you can learn lessons from them and then apply what worked and come up with ideas that may have worked better. Like for instance, they're not going to use these cables designed for mines again. Major results, fuel usage dropped by 500,000 gallons a year. Utility costs were lower than budgeted because recapturing energy when lowering, pump it back into the grid with the supercapacitor, and they saved about 30% in material costs and had to keep the heat on. They did note that. Three to four year payback expected th seven to eight years, but got it are looking at getting it back in three to four years payback. This is pretty good. Lessons that he learned, utility partners, you need to educate, inform, and cooperate with them and each other. Do your research, know the what ifs, and stick to the core of your business. Pretty cool takeaways from that session. I really enjoyed it. At the end, I asked them if they had considered hydrogen because uh, that is being considered for larger heavy duty vehicles. And they said that they have considered it, but haven't implemented it or waiting for that to kind of expand, but that they have, they have seriously considered that as an option. Each of those people on the board had something to say about that. And then later on, there was a socializing event. And I just got to say, you know, I went to this event on my own, I showed up on my own, and you really got to put on your hello, I am Francie, nice to meet you hat when you go to these, which is really fun because you get to meet people that are doing really cool work and research. So I chatted with a lot of folks in utilities. And before I got to this amazing rooftop party, I actually got, I got stuck on a one-way cobblestone street through the beautiful downtown historic street in Savannah on the river for half a mile, going 10 miles an hour. It was frustrating. I, I definitely took a wrong turn. Once I got back in and up to the rooftop, I spoke to a couple people. One person works at a utility in um, a, a northern state, and they had a battery fire in a rural community. So they had a power substation, and one of the batteries caught fire. But because of the design where the air conditioning units were connected by wires to each battery, the fire spread through those wires and burned up all the batteries when it could have been and should have been an isolated event. They had to wait days for the battery fire to go out, unfortunately. And of course, this wasn't a good look, though battery fires are not that common. I was given a stat that they used in their, in their media coverage that I will go on to investigate and do some episodes about this, but that there were 10 similar fires in the last three years and three of them were from the same manufacturer or the same designer of these battery stations. So that's something that is interesting. But no matter what, if you're living in that community and a battery fire happens right next to you, 
you might have an opinion on that. So that is something to consider is that when these fires happen, who is it affecting directly and what does that do to the perception of battery energy storage solutions? And when they burn, you can't just put them out. They have to just keep burning. So that is pretty crazy. And it was just an interesting conversation. I also spoke to someone else that's working to utilize battery energy storage solutions that are on indigenous or in indigenous reservations, Native American reservations to help integrate those onto the local grid and how that would work. So that's an interesting collaboration between different, uh, you know, regulatory entities and also, uh, you know, different cultures and communities. So I thought that was probably very interesting research that I would love to learn more about. I would have loved to meet more people and chat with them, like I said, but I didn't get to go to all the networking and socializing events. If you were there, let me know. My major takeaways from this event was that it was fun. I love to see what's happening, hear the different conversations, and that we are going in this direction where no one knows exactly what to do. Electrification is a challenge, as we have seen, and we will continue to see. So it is, it's, it's just really interesting. You know, everyone's looking for answers and no one really has them, although we might have some good ideas, but uh, this is where organizations like EPRI and these cooperations and collaborations are important because the research is being done now and in recent history, and we're still learning. So to come and chat about that research, different case studies, different examples of how people are succeeding and running into obstacles and navigating that in their electrification process of their industry or their business or their product or service is, is really, really cool and essential at this point in time. There's always a trade-off I've found between this and that. For instance, we, I spoke to one person about hydropower. This is great, but then there's also the conservation of fish right? And a lot of people weigh those similarly. We don't want a certain species of fish to go extinct. Hydropower is great, requires dams, and is, you know, a renewable energy. Uh, but those don't really, dams harm fish. <laughs> so it's like, okay, kill a lot of fish or, and use hydropower or burn more coal and don't kill the fish. It is never very clear. I'm sure there's some solution somewhere in there, but I'm not sure what it is. Preparing the grid, of course, that's a question too. How are we going to do that? There's lots of technology and so many amazing startups, but we're going to be waiting for them for a while, right? We want tried, true, proven solutions to enact. And there are startups coming up with amazing ideas and that have still, but it takes a while to get those off the ground and to get those scalable and scaled and adopted wi widely. So I think that's a challenge here as well. It's really cool to have amazing minds working on this and have that have been working on this for, for decades. Uh, but you know, it seems like we're really trying to go into hyperspeed now and we don't have everything that we need. So I love learning about what has happened, what the people have identified as challenges and key lessons to take away. And I would love to attend again. I do think these are fun events where I get to learn a lot and I would love to have spoken to more people. I really loved Savannah, Georgia. Absolutely beautiful city. I was stayed in the best part and, you know, I don't know. I, it was one part, but it was so beautiful. I walked around a lot. There are beautiful parks, great food, and I see why people would want to live there. Beautiful city. I went out to Tybee Island, which is an island on the coast. It was very sweet, lighthouse, quaint, idyllic. And it was interesting to see uh, another southeast, east coast city. And then approach also in, this was a, a you know, a big national event, international perhaps, but uh, to be in the southeast and see how people are approaching that, not only in that region, but all the regions in the U.S. and abroad. So really enjoyed the event. That's my wrap up. If you have any questions about what I experienced, what I saw, any of these topics, um, I think I'd like to dive into all of them. This is not the first example that I've seen a shipyard, a, a dockyard, a marina bay electrified. And I think it's a really cool opportunity. There are challenges with, you know, EV chargers, if you're going to use big trucks, there's challenges with electrifying cranes. And so to see how different cities are doing that is really, really cool. Okay. That's all. Another, you know, off the cuff, shooting from the hip episode, like my VinFast update, but hope you enjoyed it. I will see you next time on the next episode. Really have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.